<laughs> yeah. Welcome to the Diversity and Inclusion on Air podcast. This podcast is a program of the Association of American Veterinary and Medical Colleges Diversity Matters Initiative. The podcast explores various issues related to diversity and inclusion in the veterinary profession and provides AAVMC an opportunity to offer ongoing diversity programming to our member institutions and all veterinary professionals. My name is Lisa Greenhill. I'm the Senior Director for Institutional Research and Diversity at the AAVMC. So on today's live stream show, we are talking about visual representation and branding, or in other words, how are you showing diversity on your websites and your print media um, and any other platforms that you might be using? Is it a reflection of your current levels of diversity, which could mean that all of the pictures, the folks in the pictures look fairly homogenous, um, or is it more diverse? Um, and is that diversity um, that you're including, is it aspirational? Is it more than the folks that you're kind of working with or trying to recruit? Um, and what is important kind of, have you thought about the composition of the actual image as well? These things are a really, really big deal um, because this is all about branding and how you want to be seen by the public. Um, it's a signal to folks on whether or not you are welcoming um, and whether or not you are inclusive of people who don't look like you. Um, now there are right ways of doing this visual branding thing and there are definitely wrong ways. Um, and as an example, in the very early 2000s, there was a pretty big story about the University of Wisconsin, um, not the main university, not not the, not the College of Veterinary Medicine, um, and an admissions brochure. Now the image on the cover of the admissions brochure from that early 2000s um, featured students kind of all nice and happy and rowdy looking at a home football game. Um, the original image did not include any students of color. Okay, so someone <laughs> went into some other pictures somewhere, found a student of color, and without permission, the university photoshopped the head of the student into the crowd picture. Um, the student actually found out about it later when someone said, hey, did you know you made the cover of the admissions brochure this year? Um, yeah. None of that was good. None, none of it was good. Um, so to talk about this today, my guests are uh, Elizabeth Stone, the former dean at the University of Wealth, and Danielle Lambert, the co-founder of the Snout School. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having hey. us. Great. Yes, yes. So as is our custom on the show, I have my guests tell uh, a little bit about themselves and their background and kind of how we got here. So Danielle, why don't we start with you? Oh my gosh, how did I get here? I live down a very interesting, very specific <laughs> rabbit hole where I deal in uh, you know, veterinary marketing and veterinary branding. The briefest uh, option to tell you is I grew up in a family full of veterinary professionals. My dad is a veterinarian and owns a practice. I went from managing that practice to falling in love with marketing to creating snoutschool.com to really teach veterinary hospitals how to market themselves. That was back in 2013. And so increasingly, we are really trying to shift to work specifically with female led businesses and brands in the space and helping them to elevate themselves online. Very, very cool. The girl gang. Yes. <laughs> girl gang. Awesome. Well, welcome to the show, Danielle. And Elizabeth. Yes, yeah, so I've, I've been at the academic world for, I don't know, Many, many years. <laughs> I, when I graduated from California, I moved east to uh, Georgia and did training and have been at a number of different schools. And as you mentioned, most recently at the University of Guelph in a different country. And that in itself was a, uh, a real experience about you know, living in a country where there are living or working at a school where there weren't very many Americans and having a different perspective on some things and some things are the same. And for quite some time, I've been interested in the veterinary profession, how it is seen by the public and how we portray ourselves. And I've looked at literature, liter literary works, memoirs, movies, and then four or five years ago, I started looking at our internet presence and how intentional is it and how much of it is, you know, whatever picture happens to be happen we happen to have on file so that's how i ended up being here awesome so well why don't we dive in so uh, danielle we're gonna start with you uh can you define 
branding and this whole marketing thing. And, <laughs> yeah, tell us what it is that we're supposed to be talking about today. Right. <laughs> it is a whole thing, right? Like it's a, honestly a genuinely hard thing, I think, to define in a lot of ways because it is a very holistic thing when we talk about branding and marketing. There's so many components that go into it. But I feel like the easiest way to define branding is it's kind of the feeling that somebody gets when they think of or interact with you or your business. So like, how do you want them to feel when they look at your website? Who are you trying to attract, you know, and how do you want to make them feel when they're interacting with you is really what branding comes down to. So I think that's definitely what we are talking about today is, yeah, what do, what do people think of and, and what emotions are evoked when they think of either you, if it's a personal brand or your business? Yeah. So, you know, I think that folks don't necessarily interpret, I mean, certainly we know that web, the web presence is kind of essential now, like people who are like, you don't have a website, like, you know, when you kind of search something, search a company, and then like the little kind of box comes up, the little Google box comes up on the side panel, and you look for the thing that says, you know, website, (laughs) and if it's like dark, and there's nothing there, it's just kind of like, are you are you a real company in this day? <laughs> like, how does that work? <laughs> uh, right. Um, so college websites though, like this is a part of their brand, right? This is part of recruiting and it's a part of kind of donor relations and all of that stuff too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Without, you yeah, know, without a doubt, web pages have kind of grown organically, I suppose, oftentimes out of an IT department from in the, in the veterinary schools. And the organizational structure of who's in charge of it and, and how do they decide what goes on the web page is sometimes quite blurry. And oftentimes they're just very newsy, you know, whatever happens to be in the news or whatever interesting animal comes in the hospital, then it gets featured or whoever gets an award. And there's not perhaps as much thought given to what does the web page look like as a college would give to, say, their brochure or their their magazine that they send out that, you know, we want to be sure that we cover, you know, this and this right. and this. But Which one of the things that we found for vet students and for undergraduate students is they go to the web pages. I mean, people, and they go to the ones that are on the computer. I mean, people think that they are looking at their phones all the time, which they are. But when they want to find out, you know, what are admissions requirements or, you know, what does a school look like? They'll go to the website and they go to the homepage. And if, the first impression is so important. You know, do they do they see a place that's welcoming that fits that they they yeah. might fit into that they would they would like to go, and then they may go on and explore other things. They then may sign up for the Facebook page or the Instagram or whatever. Yeah, I mean, even on our you know social media, I mean, I'm sorry, on our web page, um, the uh, you know pages associated with admissions are like the biggest driver, right? And we just we just went through um, a web redesign and, and things, but it's always really, really interesting how much time, um, we learned a, a tough lesson a long time ago um, about how important it is to kind of vet images and be really intentional about images. Um, we almost had a Photoshopped head situation it was, it would, it was bad. <laughs> we, it was, we had a floating head draft that it's like Voldemort, like it should not be named, right? And so, um, but, but now, you know, we spend a lot of time not only thinking about diversity and the composition around diversity in our images um, online and in print, which we are moving away from print, um, we also spend a lot of time around um, what images portray different kinds of practice, different kinds of animals. And I mean, you know, we um, now produce uh, short videos and that type of thing before our annual conference. And I mean, you know, it wasn't a knockdown drag out, but it was a very strong conversation that we had last year about, you know, a mouse, uh, versus kind of pipette situation regarding, yeah. <laughs> you know, veterinary research, right? And so, um, 
the mouse was super cute because these were also animated, like, but, you know, and <laughs> we could tell an animated pipette, in the pipette. Yeah. <laughs> right, an animated pipette just doesn't yeah. <laughs> compete very well, right? And so, um, but these things, we spent a lot of time thinking about yeah. it. And, and I'm, so what I'm hearing is like, that that's a good thing. <laughs> That, you know, that's a really good thing. And, and speaking of, of making videos, even the picture that starts the video out, sometimes it, no thought is given to that. But, but if you just look at the screen, that's what people are going to see, even if they don't click on the video. And if it's just some kind of blurry thing of the back of a building, then it doesn't mean anything. So I think, you know, that even that link is, yeah. is really important. Yeah, so yeah, even the, um, you know, when you're producing on uh, YouTube, kind of going back in and putting a cover another right. <laughs> on yeah. your side. <laughs> yeah. So there's just not kind of out there. Um, Danielle, any suggestions on kind of thinking about these kinds of things? Like, yeah, I think again, it comes back to thinking about who your ideal follower is, the way I think of it in social media terms. Who is this ideal client, the ideal person that you want to be bringing in? right? And what do they want to see? How do you make them feel comfortable? How do you communicate to them that this is a place for them, right? Um, I think those are kind of the, the things that you have to get a lot of clarity on. I think in veterinary medicine, especially when we talk to the more like practice level, mm -hmm. veterinary clinics fall into a trap of really trying to be for whoever shows up <laughs> and serving whoever comes through the door, whoever calls like, okay, that's my client. I think it is really, really important to be intentional about knowing who you serve and then representing that visually online for sure. Um, so yeah, I think just having some clarity in terms of who you're trying to attract is kind of the most important first step. Yeah. So <clears throat> Elizabeth, I know that you've done um, a kind of a study of websites of the colleges. So, you know, in 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 five words before we really dive into it, <laughs> or maybe it's a thumbs up, thumbs down, <laughs> thumbs in the middle kind of situation. How are the colleges doing on representing uh, diversity among you know students, faculty, and staff on the websites? I guess it's a thumbs in the middle. I think okay. the numbers are there. I mean, we're, in fact, the uh, Blacks, for example, are overrepresented on our websites compared to what they, what exists on the, um, within the student body or within the faculty. And the same with men, although not to the same, not to the same extent. And there's a real risk in, in going overboard doing that because somebody looks at the website and they think, oh, wow, you know, I'm going to go there and there's going to be all these people who are like me. And then they go, they go on their tour and they're looking and- This is not Tuskegee. <laughs> Where do I <laughs> go? I don't, I don't see them, you know? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's, the, that's the challenge. How do, you, how do you show that you support diversity when you're not diverse to begin with? Yeah. You know, that you have aspirations to, to be better at it and you're not that way. And I, I think that's something we can talk about. So what are some of the biggest um, kind of things that, that drive that thumbs in the middle that you found um, in reviewing some of the college sites? Well, more so than the numbers. I mean, I think the numbers are probably okay. I, I think it's, it's the way people are portrayed. Mm. And in general, our students are portrayed in very passive roles, which mm. is not good. I mean, we have, we have pictures of these big classrooms. Well, Every kid knows that's what that's what college is like. You know, you go and you sit in the classroom. But veterinary medicine has so much more to offer. I mean, we do a lot of hands-on. There's a lot of learning by doing, and so more of those kinds of pictures. There were more white men instructors than any other group, and oftentimes they were at the center, surrounded by students that were. Mm. more or less interested in what they were showing. <laughs> I guess, depending on whether or not they realized a picture was being taken, I don't know as to how, <laughs> how, how engaged they were. And it's so much better when the instructor and the student are working on something together or two students are talking to each other because of course that's what they do when they go into practice. I mean, they're talking to clients, they're talking back or even by themselves. Yeah. And, then, and then students that are just enjoying each other. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that was one thing. The other is 
where are the minorities placed and mm. what, you know, what are we trying to say? And unfortunately in the group shots where there'd be like four or five students, oftentimes the minority student was at the edge. The why, I don't, I mean, if I asked somebody, they would probably say, well, that was the way they were walking. Well, that may taste, say something in itself or, you know, they're lined up and they're, you know, yeah. one person is over here or did somebody say, oh yeah, we need you, <laughs> you know, right. to come over here. I don't, yeah, I don't know. The other, the other area which I found disturbing was trying to increase to show we're diverse by showing pictures of children mm. of minority yeah. races and pictures of international development and oftentimes children. So it reinforces this stereotype of neediness and deficiency. And, you know, there's the picture of the white faculty member in Africa surrounded by black children. Yeah. Well, I mean, what, do, what, what does that show? How does that help what it is that we're doing? And you know, that would be the time of, if there's any, where that person is shoulder to shoulder, helping somebody learn or they're doing something together, which is probably what they are doing in that. I mean, they're not, they don't go to Africa to engage yeah. with children in large groups, more, more than likely. So uh, some of those some of those stereotypes I think we need to think more about. The other stereotype, and it may affect me and it may be a generational thing more than others, but there were, if there was going to be a person holding a cute dog and letting it lick them or down gazing at it, it was going to be one of the women. Mm. You didn't see that with men. And I realize everybody, you know, people love animals and all, but they're not doing anything other than just gazing or just, you know, they're just like overwhelmed by, you know, how wonderful this is. <laughs> and I know personally, when I was in high school, if that was my image of a veterinarian, I, I don't know, I, I probably would have gone some other, you know, maybe have gone some other route. So I, I think that's something to think about too. They are really good pictures. And I think when people, sometimes I think of marketing, let's get something that engages people, but we're not, you know, we're not selling products here. We're selling us doing something. Right. So, yeah. So if you're going to have those lovingly gazing into the golden retriever eyes, <laughs> maybe we need some dudes. Or dude yeah. I think some dudes or dude presenting. If, yeah, if they're going to do that. Yeah. Some, some more masculine presenting folks so that we can at least even that out. Right. If, yeah. If that's what, yeah. If that's, <laughs> You know, if that's what we want to show, that that's what we are. But I mean, I really appreciate the comments um, about that composition piece is really important because it does, it's like the person is off to the side and yeah, and off to the side and just, you know, they're there and they are a part of it. But, you know, can we get more, um, um, you know, not triggering, but can we uh, make us think that this person is literally <laughs> off to the side? Yeah, and that reminds me of, the, there was a picture of, there was, there was three people, you would have liked this because they were holding mice. <laughs> <laughs> so that was really cute. And, but and there's two women that are talking to each other, women students, and they're looking at their mice. There's another woman over here. She seems happy enough. She's holding her mice. Well, the two women that are talking are white and it's a black student that's over on this side. Mm -hmm. Well, again, it, it may, it was, who knows? They may all talk all the time, but the image again is just, is just sort of this, oh, okay. Those are the ones that fit in. And then there's this person here and some of it is the uh, photographic technique, mm -hmm. which I think schools really need to pay more attention to. Some, some schools, when they do their labels for different pages, they blur out the background so the label stands out. Well, if you're gonna do blurry, people with darker skin, you, they're gonna be more blurred than somebody yeah. with a, you know, a lighter skin. And you can at least see their eyes, the others are blurry. Yeah. Or, I think again, it's just not having the proper lighting. If you've got a group of people, you know, the camera, especially, you know, if they're automatic cameras, they, you know, they, they sense the amount of white in the room and they leave the person uh, of color so that 
you know, they don't, you know, you don't see the, the beauty of their face or, yeah. or their, even their, you know, expressions. Maybe they were unhappy even, but that would be worth showing. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's the, the, the lighting piece is really, really important. Um, I have a whole middle school yearbook where basically all of us black and brown people are just kind of blobs on yeah. like many boxes across the page. <laughs> I mean, they were setting the, the, the levels with me. So it was like, right. <laughs> <laughs> right? like we're blobs, but here's the thing: oh. the white people were like Casper. Like you can just see the eyes. And it was like everything else was gone. Like I mean, this yearbook. I remember when my parents got it and they were like, "What?" Is <laughs> and they probably God. sent you a whole package of you know, like, don't you want to buy this? Because <laughs> that's what they usually they used to do. Yes, like, don't you want to buy these class pictures? My parents were like, absolutely not. And then find that it was the whole yearbook, and you know, oh had. Gosh over contrast kind of thing. <laughs> the last thing I think is really, really important and kind of gets to um, some wording I used in an earlier, um, in an earlier uh, show was kind of this decolonizing of the pictures. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Danielle, I'm sure you've seen a lot in this particular space and, and it happens, a, you know, this kind of echoes of colonialism, but that's not really an echo, it's more like a bullhorn where, you know, folks kind of go and they're doing good things in, in under, um, uh, you know, underdeveloped countries. And, um, you know, the big takeaway is here are me with kids that I spent two <laughs> minutes throwing candy at. And, and it's that, that they don't care about the kids, but that was like, not a part of the project at all. Like, yeah, like Right, but it makes for a really great Instagram post. <laughs> right, right. It's so yeah. interesting, right? Because I think starting with millennials and definitely with Gen Z, these like these generations do really have like a philanthropic heart and want to go do these things, right? But then you mesh that with social media and you start to get some weird results. Um, I follow an account on Instagram that's actually called at no white saviors. Oh, and yes. it kind of, yeah. Oh. And it like brings up these different people that it's like, mm. you went to this place and all you went to do was to get like the clout or the credit or anything like that. And I think it comes back to just how intentional you have to be now. Like if you're building a personal brand, you really need to think about yeah. this stuff and think about how you're presenting. I have not always gotten it right, not in that sense, but 150%, like if you look at the Snout School website literally right now, as we're talking, end of November, 2020, um, I'm not super proud of the photography that we have because I wasn't super intentional about it. I was just like, oh, hey, um, I need a couple vet students. Can you bring them over and we're gonna do a photo shoot? Or, hey, I need, you know, um, oh, I work with this veterinary team in Portland, Oregon. Are you guys all free this day? Shocking in Portland, Oregon, what I got as a result. So um, <laughs> it, it's just, it's, it's something that in general, you have yeah. to really think about it through that different lens and, and really think about what you're, you're putting out there and how you're portraying the other people that are involved. Yeah, I think that's absolutely, absolutely true. And I, you mentioned uh, stock photos. Mm. Um, Lisa mentioned that. Oh, and yeah. I think it would be different probably in your world, world, Daniel, but for veterinary schools, I think they need to be really careful because there's, there's not like, okay, we're gonna show that we treat these different kinds of animals or we do these procedures. We're showing these are our people and we've got you know 500 people that work here or 200 people that work here and to then bring in a stock photo and, and why are we bringing it? And it's more likely that the stock photos will be of minorities. Right. And if, if people do feel for whatever reason, then they should be using minority owned stock photo companies where the lighting is right and they understand, you know, the dynamics and all, and you don't just have, you know, some person that's, that's stuck in there because they, you can check that box. Right, right. I think that's a super interesting point in general because I'm overall not a fan of stock photography. Okay. It's why, it's really why I, um, with, I did two photo shoots for Snout School about like two years ago and three years ago, right? Um, and was prepping to do another one and then 2020 happened and it's a little complicated. Um, but 
those two, I was really intentional about wanting to bring in actual veterinary professionals, actual women yeah. in veterinary medicine. Um, there's one person in some of my stock photos who is a nurse, but she was my friend and she was free that day. So I was like, get in on here, <laughs> you know, hold my dog. Um, and you don't have scrubs, you're ready to go. Um, but I really am a big fan of that in general. Like I like to see the actual people because again, I mean, you, you really are going to I don't like to catfish people, right? Like, what are you going to get, right? Like, you want right. to put out an authentic um, yes. version of yourselves. And that's where I feel like universities really, you know, bringing in photographers, showing things in action. If you have a teaching hospital, taking pictures in there, showing who, you know, and honestly, a lot of times it might reflect the issue that you have that you need to address. Cause that's definitely for, for me, what happened is I was like, Oh shoot. When I like really looked at it one day, I was like, "Uh Oh, <laughs> I have a problem. Right. And, and I think that that's where, you know, you kind of have to start from, from that place. And I actually, I, I have a little bit of a question for you because I've always been curious why veterinary schools are so hesitant to have their vet students share things on social media, because I think it is one of the best ways now that you can say, hey, we do have this diverse group and we do believe in representation. So, you know, share your selfie and tell your story about what you learned that day. Um, it's been something I've always been curious about. And I feel like I've, I've trapped you here. And I can <laughs> well, I, I, I've had discussions with that. And now the Ontario Veterinary College, they do for um, uh, Instagram, for the stories, th they, they feature students every day. In fact, they designated students for the clubs and for the different classes to, to put things out. And right. it does show quite a bit of, uh, it does show quite a bit of diversity and their right. opinions. There's always been a concern about patients, you know, yeah. and, and patient privacy. And that's why, and when we went through the websites, most of the pictures of students doing things with animals were with beagles, <laughs> which is not the population, but, right. but they would be, be beagles available or the horses that are used, sure. that are part of the herd that are owned because, you know, you're not going to show somebody's valuable racehorse, you know, having a procedure done on it. So, right. You guys have always been, so like um, Ontario Veterinary College, I should say, has been one of the more proactive and like um, modern about yeah. this kind of rule. I can remember uh, there was like the externship project, like a blogging series that they- That's right. Yeah, and they still are. Yep. Yeah, they're st yep. that started while I was there and it's continued on. But, yeah. But the communications people there are very forward thinking yes. about that. And and at the time, I'm I'm not, at, I wasn't as controlling that we, you know, we have to be careful. We actually ended up with better- a, a greater diversity than when we, when it was just sort of left to the IT people or the, um, you know, just to, to the staff yeah. or the, yeah. the old people, I guess yeah. I should well, say. Well, that's great to hear actually. Cause that's the thing. Cause I always thought of that school. It's the one school that I always put like the caveat on when I'm like, Oh, schools don't really let you, you know, yeah. live. And I don't <laughs> know. Social. Other schools may be doing that. Yeah, more, I'm not sure. And I think the the new or well, it's not so new now, but with Instagram where you can put it on there and it's there for 24 hours and then it disappears. So it doesn't right. become a part of the history of your school, I suppose. Right. Mm -hmm. right, right. No, it's just something that I think, you know, like as a lot of these veterinary students are building personal brands, I just see such an opportunity for the veterinary schools to say, hey, yeah. you know what, let's elevate person and they, you know, this, you know, if there's, I can think of a couple of black veterinary students that have, you know, five, 10,000 followers, it's like elevate her and, and yeah. show up what she's doing. Um, I think that's one of the most authentic ways that you can kind of have this visual representation. Yeah, I think that's good. And one of the things that I've thought about would be fun for a, a school to have a, a diversity photography, a photo contest. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Faculty, staff, students, anybody can participate and submit photos and, and they wouldn't all be used, but it would, for one yeah. thing, it would tell you what people think diversity, what, what they think what about I mean. diversity and what it right, is. Right. And then it would give you all of these possible images. And if you did it every year, then your images could be you yeah. know, updated and right. you can use them throughout the year for, for the things that are planned. 
Yeah, no, I love that because that's exactly to kind of rectify what the Snout School website looks like right now. Like I just reached out to, you know, our community on, on Instagram, we have 15,000 followers. A lot of them are, you know, in veterinary school or young associates. And I was like, Hey, listen, blind spot here trying to rectify it's 2020 I can't do a photo shoot do you (laughs) guys want to submit photos and so many women submitted photos and so I am really proud of when you look at our blog page like the featured images for our blogs and what we push out on social is way more representative Um, so I think that's an easy solution what you just said to kind of get everybody involved yeah kind of um yeah yeah crowd crowd sharing that exactly uh, exactly well our students are much much smarter and more tuned than we ever give them credit for. <laughs> exactly <You> know, we're, <laughs> we, <laughs> yeah but I mean I'm really glad that you talked a bit about the the stock photo um thing and and I really also appreciate that you know that's really not the direction we want to go in however <laughs> well it, yeah that folks are insisting on using, um, and Elizabeth and I have laughed about this before, um, you know, the, the ubiquitous yoga tree person to talk about <laughs> well-being, like, <laughs> who's like on a rock somewhere at sunrise or sunset <laughs> doing salutations and meditation. Um, like, you know, if for some reason you are going to do that, um, you know, there are certainly um, POC, BIPOC um, and POC owned and women owned um, stock photo companies that actually have, um, you know, uh, that that specialize in, in um, you know, providing res- um, resources and access to uh, stock photos that, you know, feature folks of color and LGBT folks and and disability and all of those kinds of things. And so if you're gonna do that, which it is clear that the recommendation is don't, (laughs) (laughs) but I'm thinking like maybe for some of those very small practices that, you know, Danielle, you might be working with where, you know, there might be aside from point and shoot on the iPhone 11 pro, you know, there might be a need to augment. Yes, absolutely. And then I think, you know, it, it comes down to, you know, really just kind of, yeah, like you said, being intentional about what you include. If you're going to do it, it's not ideal, but if you have to do it, be intentional. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think that's, I think that's what's really important. Yeah. And then um, the lighting, as mentioned, I mentioned my yearbook. Um, there are also, you know, if you are on social media, especially Instagram, um, there are wonderful, wonderful, wonderful black and brown um, photographers that, you know, are doing all kinds of cool stuff on social media that will teach you how to properly light folks with more melanin because, yeah. you know, um, and I mean, and this is, we're kind of in a I don't want to say a golden age, but I mean, you know, just in my lifetime, I'm like, this is the best kind of lighting age that I've lived through. But I mean, now that we're seeing more creators of color, um, certainly online, but also on TV, um, lighting has improved on those shows and you can see the difference how- Without a doubt. Yeah, without a doubt, you can see the difference and the richness of, you know, colors and not just for folks, but just everything in that scenery. And I mean, I just think of a couple of shows shows like, um, you know, well, almost all of Shonda Rhimes shows, right? Um, um, How to Get Away with Murder, when the lighting was really, really amazing. Um, and it was important to her and to Viola Davis as, you know, a darker skin uh, woman, um, but also shows like Queen Sugar and, and other movies that are coming out. The lighting is different and folks may not know it um, or right. notice it, but I do. People like me, we notice it because like we want to look good and lighting can ruin everything. Yeah. Oh no, that's what, absolutely. Yeah. So after after the show, I might have to go dig out that um that sad, sad yearbook. <laughs> <laughs> and I will post yeah, it. I'm curious show. to see, like that is <laughs> yeah, yeah like, that is interesting. It's, it's bad. I mean, it's so oh, bad yeah. that we bought the yearbook because we knew like. 30 years later. I'd like a historical it. reference. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> so, um, you know, um, what I'm kind of, I'm curious now, um, Dayo, what are you telling these, these folks that are coming to do business with you and what are they going to learn in the snout school? And certainly it's about intentionality. That is absolutely kind of the number one thing that should be, you know, your baseline, but, uh, yeah. What other guidance can you give folks? 
It's kind of an interesting time when it comes to veterinary practices, which kind of in the coming um, year, Snout School is definitely shifting to focus more on individual women versus veterinary practices. Of course, that means that individual women can own a veterinary practice and might need to um, you know, kind of focus on this stuff. But I think like, again, like the big takeaways are really about authenticity and representing, I think, you know, what you really are as a brand and how you want to like, who you want to make feel welcome, who you want to kind of be, uh, applying to jobs for you, things like that. And to me, I mean, visuals are great, but I, I really like to advocate for especially veterinary practices. If we're talking about them, if you want to bring in more diversity, what are you doing in your current marketing and your current actions, um, in real life to convey that, right? Because I think of, you know, a couple months back, um, when things were really, really heated after, um, after George Floyd's, um, Mm. death that I, I think that all of a sudden there was a lot of veterinary consultants saying, oh, we can't say black lives matter at, at work. You know, that's politics. And we can't talk about that. Like a lot of prominent veterinary consultants said that on their podcast, things like that. And you're like, oh, okay. Um, we need to unpack that because you can't both have that point of view and then wonder why you don't have any, you know, people of color to pose in your pictures. Like (laughs) it it really kind of adds up. Right. Mm -hmm. And it is a complicated thing where it's like, okay, you're out here and you're messaging all the time is that, you know, all pets matter, but we're really not super uncomfortable, you know, super comfortable that we, you know, agree that we want to support every human life on the same level. So I think to the practices that I work with, if somebody comes to me and they say, you know what, we looked around and we realized, you know, we're not super representative of the location that we are in and we want to foster more, um, you know, people of color on our team so that we, like I said, even have them to be in the pictures to begin with. I think where I really come from is a place of you need to do something with the community and, and do community outreach, get involved, be outspoken about these things. Cause otherwise you can't just hope that they're going to come to you. I made that mistake with snout school, 150%. Um, like two years ago when I was trying to recruit a group of female entrepreneurs, I was like, do I know any black women in the world that want to work with me? And And surprisingly, nobody showed up. You can't just be like, Hey, you know, um, you have to put in the work and, and you have to, you know, be authentic about it. And so I have really invested in educating myself and trying to, you know, support different communities in the last couple of years. And don't, you know, when I have a bunch of women applying to my personal branding boot camp, I have way more diversity than I used to, instead of like, you know, 10, 40 year old white women that are specialists. So they have the money for the program and that's it. I end up having a whole diverse group of, of people. So I think to me, I really go back really deep to basics. Like I can't tell you how to market your way out of this. You know, you need to actually be authentically invested in these communities and do things that matter for them. And that will attract the right people to you for talking about employees and same thing for, you know, team member. I mean, uh, for clients too, pet owners. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I want to get to that. It doesn't always don't, you know, don't approach it with deficit thinking, right? So that right. doesn't necessarily mean engaging communities of color all the time. I mean, certainly some communities of color will need um, like free or no cost, like vaccines and spay neuter. Absolutely. But please don't think that that's the thing that gets you the big by itself diversity check but <laughs> like but see, that also bothers me inherently that bothers me yeah. right because I don't like the assumption it's like it's definitely- that does come up exactly that does come up I'm like there are you know affluent people of color that might want to come to your bougie clinic it doesn't <laughs> mean that you need to discount you know prices to attract people of color it just means again in that kind of situation say you're in a city Right. So you've got like a diverse um, population around you, but you're in 
an expensive area of the city, right? Then that's where it comes down to, you know, saying these things on your social media, talking about them, just talking about this stuff, talking about how you interact with the community and what you do. Um, but that could, you know, attract that, that bougie client of, uh, of color. There's plenty. Yeah, it exists. Yeah. Yeah. You were just going to attract Lisa to your practice. And wouldn't that be fantastic? <laughs> well, I think that brings up, in, you know, I was talking about, you know, pictures of children or international development. Right. The third area where colleges show diversity is when they're doing community outreach and they're doing low cost or no cost clinics. And then they show, you know, the student with, you know, with the yeah. uh, person of color and their dog again, oh, that's okay. But if that's the only, again, you know, then, then somebody who doesn't identify with that, they may also be a person of color, but they don't identify with somebody who, who needs subsidized vet care. I mean, they've right, always right. had a dog, they've gone to the vet, they wanna be a vet. They want to be a vet that can charge money for what they do because they have a clientele. Right. And yeah. I, th I think that's, that's not just an image, image on the website it, problem. I think it's a problem for the veterinary schools where they, students, if the only way that they're learning primary care is through low cost services, and what does that tell them about how they're going to make a living? And, and you know, are they going to then feel guilty about charging for what they do? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's... that. So. Yeah, no, but I mean, you know, Elizabeth, I think it's important for folks to realize that, that there is there are inherent biases when you kind of pull back some of the layers. And, that, and we're not saying don't do the clinics because we keep doing the clinics, um, but recognize that if that is, if those kinds of images on your website are the only depictions of yourself with those communities, you know, right. folks of color, please know for me, I'll be really blunt, shocking, right? Um, it's exploitive. <laughs> It's exploitive of those. Yeah, I think it is. And, and, not, um, and, and but even just doing the clinics without involving the community leaders, I mean, it, it needs to be some kind of a partnership. It's not just, okay, we're going to go out, we're going to do, you know, this, you know, to, again, like what you were saying, you know, check off. We, okay, we've done that. All right, now we can come back and, and keep doing what we're doing. It, you know, yeah. how do you get more involved with the community? And that does actually bring up something that I, was, that I wanted to mention because you were asking, well, what can schools do if they're not very diverse? I mean, oftentimes their student support people are more diverse. And I don't think, some people may say it's tokenism. I, I, it depends on how it's presented, but I think showing pictures or images of the people who can support minority students is a good idea because if somebody comes into a new town and oftentimes people are moving to a new community, well, you know what you have to do. You have to find, you know, where can you find the food you like? Where can you go get your hair done? Where can you, where's a place of worship? All of these different things. And if there's nobody that's like you, then, you know, how, who do you find? Well, there are people within the schools, but mm -hmm. oftentimes the schools are so hierarchical you know, who, who gets shown, who gets talked to, who gets brought out, you know, those kinds of things. And again, that addresses more of a structural issue with the schools, but it also, I think we can, we can do something about it on our uh, web pages. Yeah. I mean, I think it's so, that is, a you know, the kind of the elevation of, of, um, of faculty and staff of color, because, you know, I think that, I think back again, to my own experience um, being kind of first generation, you know, my parents were really concerned. We, you know, it was like, we we're all navigating this for the first time, but all of the schools that I was looking at attending were not terribly diverse. Um, shocking. Um, but, but, um, but my parents, one of their big questions was who's going to look after her, right? Do you have yeah. faculty, yeah. are there staff around here that, can can show her where the, that she can ask where these things are for basic kind of living needs. Um, um, how will she build community? Will somebody be there to kind of usher her in? Like, can she get, um, you know, folks that are, um, you know, potential mentors or just confidants, you know, just yeah. in that space. And so, you know, I don't, I think that it is really important to make sure that there's some visibility to those folks as well. Yeah. 
I mean, it all comes back to like, how do you want that person to feel when they're looking at this? Right. right. And so I think to kind of show off those, those kinds of people and those kinds of roles. Yeah. Maybe you don't have a, you know, we don't have a billion black professors, let's be real. Right. right. But Hey, we do have these people in our community that are going to show you around. Cause especially if you're being shipped off to vet school, you're probably going to a cornfield somewhere. So like you want to kind right. of know, well, that's you know just, that there'll right. be somebody, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like let's just, yeah, I, I, I'm in Worcester. I'm a couple minutes away from uh, Tufts, right? I grew up in Grafton, Massachusetts. Like, I don't know. Like, if a black girl ends up at Tufts, I don't know where the hell is she's going to get her hair done. She's going to have to know somebody from the area that knows, like, where in Worcester you can go. And I think that's huge. Yeah, it is. No, it is. It is huge. And I think, and I've only recently been thinking about this more and more, that many of the veterinary schools are from they're in universities that were historically segregated until yeah. you know the 70s yeah. and so the parents or the grandparents i mean they had the experience that they would never even walk on the campus and so there's a lot of you know I, I, that that what we have inherited our heritage has veterinary schools um mm -hmm. there's a lot there's a lot to overcome and a lot that we don't understand which of course is why we need to have a more diverse advisory group that's saying, you know, this is how it is. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. When I very first started um, my career in vet med, I would go and you know, schools would have me come out to to do some diversity work and and programming and speaking and stuff. And I would actually sneak in the night before. <laughs> um, I try to sneak in the night before, and um, you know, I have a rental car and I'm driving around like, okay, so can I identify where I can get hair products? Um, we were still all women, women were wearing pantyhose still at that point. Like, thank God that's not a thing. They're yeah, so I'm like, that's, those days are <laughs> I remember the day my mom finally stopped yelling at me about it. And I was like, yes. <laughs> so, but I would try to find like, okay, so is there a store yeah. Like, you know, in spitting distance where I can get pantyhose that are not nude or suntan so that I don't look weird. Like, I mean, I brought my own, but I'm just kind of wondering if I was a new student yeah. in the area, you know, and even then there were times when I could find stuff, but again, composition and placement and all of that kind of stuff and marketing and branding and all of that stuff is so important. Stuff would be at the bottom of the shelf. So I'm like, you know, on my knees in like Walgreens and Fort Collins, like, you know, like, oh, look, they have like brown, the, you know, it's just, you know, and I was able to find some, you know, hair products or whatever, but, but this is something, and I remember, you know, when I would have my chat with the deans and associate deans, and was like, yeah, I slipped into town and like, it's hard for, it would be hard for an African-American student here um, because if you know women can't find our hair products and I mean I wear my sh hair really short I'm like you don't have no idea around the culture around black barbershops like th the brothers are not gonna be able to get a lineup and it's gonna be <laughs> tragic like it's really gonna not be a good thing and so you know and it, it it took a long time for folks to really try to understand what I'm um um, you know, trying to, um, to, to say, but having that, you know, um, that black male faculty on, um, you know, who doesn't have a jacked up haircut on the website is important because black male students um, will then know there is somewhere <laughs> that they can go to get a decent haircut. Yeah. Well, and that's something that, you know, as a faculty member, I was a faculty at NC State for 22 years. I was not aware of at all. I mean, I didn't, I never even, it, it was not something that I even thought about. I mean, I knew there was a black community within yeah. Raleigh, but that's as, that's as far as I got. And we didn't, you know, there were people within the school that helped. But of course, and this happens a lot with minority faculty, they, spend a lot of time doing that and then of course when it comes time for evaluations and all then that's not recognized as much as some of the other things that are being done and so yeah it's it, it is real and I think it uh it it still continues but there is more of awareness and part of it is for you Lisa to go <laughs> around to these various places and and tell them you know somebody that they respect tell them whereas you know a student would be really 
Yeah. You know, they they would hesitate because they're just trying to fit in. And I think yeah, about yeah. that. You know, when I started veterinary school and there weren't as, well, not anywhere near as many women as now, we just tried to be like one of the guys. And we didn't want someone just to, to point out that um, we yeah. had to use different facilities. We couldn't use the hay bale. You know, there's things like that, that <laughs> anatomically a wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It makes me think about it. I to use so, real facilities. <laughs> right? you, honestly, like, it's funny when you were talking, uh, Lisa, I was thinking about, you know, in, um, is it Hidden Figures, the movie? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. But she has to go to the bathroom and she can like, there's just like not a lot of you know, bathrooms for women, never mind, you know, uh, like a black woman at the time. So like, they're like, where is she going all day? Right. And it's like, she has to go 20 miles just to get to the bathroom. Yeah. And I feel like now, I feel like I might, uh challenge some of my vet student um, personal brand friends to kind of almost do, I feel like you could do kind of like a treasure hunt of like, can you find these things? Oh. The schools will really love me when I do. <laughs> I will say, I will say it's gotten a lot yeah. better. Yeah, it's, it's gotten cool, a lot though. better in the last decade, but yeah. you know, it was the pantyhose thing by itself was bad. Right. <laughs> right, right. No, it's just interesting. Like, can you find these things? Can you accept like, and just like in terms of like accessibility, um, you know, for anybody, you know, that might, you know, have different disabilities, things like that. I feel like it would kind of be an interesting thing to kind of do like a little challenge and peruse well, around. And, and you bringing up the disability and we didn't, we didn't mention that, mm -hmm. but disabilities weren't shown on any of the website images that we, that we uh, looked at. And also, of course, the non-visible yeah. uh, diversity. We need to figure out ways that, you know, we might, how do we show, how do we show support for, yes. you know, LGBTQ plus? I mean, what, you know, what do we do? I know, you know, when it's, when it's pride week, then, you know, maybe somebody, you know, they'll put a rainbow flag, but what do you do the rest of the time without, again, engaging in stereotypes? Yeah. But the, but the images are, well, they're thin white women with long straight hair. I mean, if you had to say that's what a vet, that's what a vet is, that's what a vet student is. Well, we don't, we don't do a very good job even of showing people of different body types, yeah. because, well, because, it, because people have to be pretty confident in their body to stand in the front, you know, to stand mm -hmm. in the front of the group picture or to say, yes, you can take my picture. Well, most of us would say, forget it. I don't want my picture <laughs> taken. So, but how do you do that then? How do you show, yeah, yeah we've got all kinds of people, you know, that um, we got short people and long people, we got people with really short air, we've got people with tattoos. I mean, we, we, we are in those areas more mm -hmm. diverse than we, than we portray on our mm -hmm. uh, web page. That is Great. So yes, now you know colleges and uh, practices working with Danielle. We want to see some body positivity. <laughs> right. we see. Right. It's we funny wanna... I was thinking about that this morning actually, because uh, Figs, the scrub brand, I uh -huh. think they do a really good job in certain ways with representation. And it was funny because I was like looking through what they're doing, and I was like, oh, it's so good. And I was like, except for kind of more like body type stuff, which especially with a clothing related brand. I know it's huge for me. And I think it, you, when we kind of think of brands right now, I think it really speaks to the resurgence that American Eagle has been able to have um, with their airy brand is like, you go and you look and it's like bras and underwear and, um, and, you know, bathing suits, but you don't look at it on this model that is like this big around, like I'm, I'm, I'm like a size eight. So I'm like a medium. And like, it's so nice to just even just see medium represented is like, Oh, you know? And so I think honestly, that experience too had really opened my eyes to how important this stuff is because it's not like I'm, you know, uh, typically, you know, the victim of anything um, as a uh, relatively attractive and smart white woman that is, you know, you know, but I think certain things like that are you all of a sudden see, you're like, Ooh, we need this. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think that's really interesting. And I think the, the disability one is huge. I have a good uh, vet student friend who is uh, Jessica Hirsch. She's running an account called Disabled DVM. Mm -hmm. And she is really trying to lean into that because 
just kind of talking about like accessibility and what this like looks like and how do you involve people and there's there's so many rabbit holes to fall down on this stuff but I think um just dipping your toe in at least and, and trying is so important oh wow disabled dvm yeah, yeah. So she's disabled DVM on Instagram um, and she's really trying to build a community around that. And it's so interesting, you know, her mm -hmm. kind of endorsing what Snout School does. One of the ambassadors that we brought on um, for our student ambassador program, um, she's deaf. And all of a sudden I had to deal with, okay, now I have to bring in interpreters to help her. But then like so many of the girls on the call were like, oh, we're trying to learn ASL. So this is like exciting that we can kind of follow along and know what's going on. Um, so I, I think again, you know, just uh, there's a lot of the students really, uh, you know, to Elizabeth's point are smarter than we <laughs> give them credit for, especially, you know, veterinary school is pretty competitive. Um, so I think we should give them credit. They're, they're smart and they're doing resourceful things right now that really, I think will have great impact. Awesome. So uh, yeah, I definitely have already scooted on over there to <laughs> Lurking on Jessica, I love it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's really important for us to also be mindful and intentional about ways of including, um, you know, disabled folks. And of course, AABMC, we've been focused on that a lot this fall with the book Academic Ableism by Jay Domage. Um, great, great, great book. If you have not read it, please pick it up. Um, it's free. You can get it for free, um, but uh, it's a really great book um, and, and has started really making me think about ways of, of being more intentional in um, inclusion programs at AAVMC. And the author, Dr. Dalmage, will be one of our keynote speakers for the um, at our annual conference in March. So stay tuned for more information about that. Yeah. All right. So as we wrap up the last couple of minutes, any other parting sage wisdom to <laughs> our listeners and viewers. I really would close out with just don't catfish people, be authentic and, you know, do the work that you need to do to, to attract these people in these communities, educate yourself, all of that jazz. And uh, if you want to track me down, I'm at Danielle Snout on Instagram or snoutschool.com slash start is where you can kind of join up with us. Awesome. And I would just say that the, you know, the schools have their hearts in the right place and they need to be thinking about, you know, the intentionality and have, have diversity and diversity and communications as a part of their strategic plan and then audit it to see where they are and get advice from people, whether they are staff or faculty or clients who are not like them as to just what the images show and how they might be interpreted. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Good stuff. All right. Thank you both. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Great discussion. <laughs> yes. This has been another episode of AAVMC's Diversity and Inclusion on Air to my guest. Again, thank you so much for being on the show. You can subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app and be sure to like us on our Facebook page, AAVMC's Diversity and Inclusion on Air. Thanks so much and see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.